Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda. Hello and welcome to Future Energy Talks with me, Andrew Wilson. This year, this time in Baku, Azerbaijan, the world's leaders, climate experts and scientists will converge once again to further debate what concrete steps can be taken to ensure current ambitious climate change plans are met. Today, we're going to look at the crucial issue of energy transition. The numbers suggest that transition is well underway, with renewable solutions accounting for 30% of global electricity. Solar and wind power can now be classed as more affordable than 82% of fossil fuels. According to IEA predictions, in the next five years, the share of these two renewable energy sources in the world's electricity supply may reach 75%. But electrical power to buildings and cars is only part of the story. There's so much more at stake in a world of climate change. Where are the next opportunities when laying out a plan to a successful energy transition? And what are the challenges that need to be overcome? Here to help us address those questions and more is Dr. Nina Skorupska, who sits on the supervisory board of Royal BAM Group. Until recently, she was CEO for the Association of Renewable Energy and Clean Technology, a post she held for more than 10 years. Dr. Skorupska is what we might call an industry pioneer. Indeed, she first attracted headlines by becoming the first female power station manager for RWE NPower in the UK. Nita, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, first of all, you've bridged both parts <laughs> of this kind of career, if you like, the energy production and renewable energy and that production. With that unique view, what challenges do you think we should be focusing on at this point in the game? Oh, well, I, I've worked right across, as you say, in uh, power production from fossil sources through to, for the last 11 years, having the privilege to represent the growing sector in renewable energy and clean technology. And change is inevitable, but change is also difficult for people to appreciate. And it, it's all about helping understand both financially and also what it means for our planet. But having those conversations with the right people at the right time, in the right places, such as at COP, are absolutely key to seeing this transition really happen. So briefly, you're optimistic about the framework we have in place so far with these annual meetings and the kind of things that garner the headlines. They're the kind of things we should be looking at. At the highest levels, they have to happen. And as an optimistic realist, you know, you always hope for the best, but know that you have to work very, very hard at all levels of society to make sense of what's going on and to make it happen. We need to see action. Lots of words happen at these meetings, and then the proof in the pudding is then what actually gets done. Let's take a quick look at some of the drier stuff that's been coming out of COP over the years. The first global stock take concluded the UAE consensus at COP28, which aims to triple the renewable energy capacity. How much progress is being made on that, for example, worldwide, do you think? Well, we keep hearing records over and over of that solar now not only is the cheapest, but is now being deployed at a faster rate than any other fossil form of generation. And in fact, we're seeing here in the UK the closure of coal-fired power stations. So this will be the first G7 country to absolutely not generate anything from coal. So you have these landmark indicators, but everybody in a consensus views, we need to do more and faster. So tripling renewables and doubling efficiency was the mantra from Dubai. So we've got to see how much progress we've made in this one year and also in Brazil in COP30 as well. Well, indeed, but th this focus on national policy mm -hmm. under an international umbrella. So the sophisticated advanced economies can export a lot of their pollution if they like. So we may stop coal mining, for example, in the UK, but we may buy in coal from somewhere else, They're, thereby putting it on someone else's uh, figure sheet, if you like. I mean, do we need to get rid of some of those borders and how people operate in this field now? 
Well, I think some great leadership has come through in terms of accounting. You know, the ESG, the environmental sustainability goals that many corporates have signed up to and there is a requirement in the EU that corporates need to define where do and how they are making their products, building their products, growing their products, how they are delivering their products to consumers and ultimately accounting for how those consumers are using those products. So those are called like scope one, scope two and scope three. And it's getting very tricky to be able to account for all of this in a very clear and transparent way. So the important thing is this could be an industry in itself, this reporting. Who's now going to make sure, and when we come to COP29 in Baku and the financial confidence, how do we make sure we can police that accountability of all the promises that people are saying? And there's always that individual hurdle for different countries and different circumstances about bringing this stuff to market. The infrastructure not being available, the stories you read in the papers simply about people buying electric cars and then finding it hard to charge them in certain parts of the country they live in. Is the market keeping up with the ambition at this particular stage? I think it's steps forwards and steps back. Technology has always gone ahead of what policy and regulation can follow. Governments are usually catching up with the solutions. Like for instance, back in uh, 2013, 14 and 15, everybody was saying that solar and offshore wind and wind technologies would be cheaper, but everybody was going, no, we don't believe it. And then hey ho, when the investment goes in there and the support from government occurs, we see those prices coming down. And then a new area came in, energy storage. And then you have the troublemakers, you know, what should I call the, the troubleshooters who come in and say, we believe that electric vehicles are gonna be the way, and then they disrupt the existing market. So you see this kind of enthusiasm and then a pullback from the people who are not really wanting to see that change, and then a surge forward as everybody gets behind it. So where are we with this? We're in the transition, we're in it, right in the thick of it. So you're gonna see people who are saying, EVs are great, I'm gonna go for it, but if we want mass take up, we need to make it easy, straightforward and clear. When the general public look at renewable technology, of course they think of national grids, of domestic heating, sometimes the manufacturing sector as well, electric cars. But are there other sectors that are still being neglected? Other sectors perhaps that might need different technology or different approaches? Oh, there are many. I mean, everybody, the long list is there, but that the last COP in Dubai, it was really pleasing to hear a focus coming onto the built environment, on construction, and also to accelerate and understand the view around agriculture. And so, how all of these things come together to reduce greenhouse gases is going to be key. And I anticipate that this is going to be followed up at COP29 and will be particularly relevant in COP30 when we come to Brazil and Brazil's agricultural positioning as well. I mean, can you see those different bits of data being gathered ready for presentation in the coming meetings? I think... I know that the different nations are being asked to compile that, to identify what would be the measures and the ambition levels, and it'll then become part of their nationally determined contributions. So all of these things will be factored in. Well, on a personal level, you've now moved from a long career in energy production to the construction sector. Mm -hmm. Do they welcome the kind of skills that you bring from where you've been in the past? Well. I guess it depends which company you speak to, but the one that I chose to join the supervisory board of three years ago really had laid down in their strategy that sustainability was absolutely going to be a core of the way that they want to take their business forward. And so in the last few years, I've been proud to be helping shape that strategic agenda. So I'm not in the executive that does but I bring my expertise from the energy sector to understand of what can be and how it could go forward and what would good practice be. And in a way, 
as a European company working across international boundaries, they also need to fulfill the ESG requirements, but they are absolutely critical to enabling other corporates and other businesses fulfill theirs too, because they are building their offices, they're building the bridges, they're building the civil structures that even transformers for the offshore wind are going to be coming to on land. There's no doubt that plenty of people who you talk to are looking for leadership <laughs> examples in the construction sector, particularly uh, to see progress being made in decarbonising the operations. Uh, do you hear chat in your corridors where you are now about the use of AI in helping achieve those kind of goals? Oh, absolutely, because we want to focus on the other aspect that you asked me about, the doubling energy efficiency. This is where AI really plays a part. In fact, AI plays two roles. One, in increasing energy demand, <laughs> because we hear from the likes of Meta and other organisations that in order for us to embrace the technology solutions we need for the future, we're going to be building so many more data centres, energy centres, I call them now, because they can play a part of not just taking energy, but they can deliver it into society. But also, the technologies needed in modelling, in looking at how buildings can optimise to be learning instruments and accommodating people's wishes. Because ultimately, in all of these buildings, transport, people are using them. So how do we optimise that and get that for the benefit of climate change too? In these broader issues of construction and, uh, and the larger manufacturing sector, we've experienced already in, in grid electricity and in transportation on the roads, consumer energy and motivation playing a huge role in, in pushing political change, in, in pushing technological change. Do you think that consumer energy can be harnessed uh, to encourage changes in the, in the more shadowy sectors, in the less obvious sectors that we need to deal with? Well, I, I, that's a, such a good question because you can see this happening in pockets where people are choosing by voting with their purse where they procure their various different items, whether they are basic materials through to choices in fashion. You see in the fashion industry also having to embrace sustainability, where does all the, the, the crops, materials, um, whether they come from a fossil sector or from an organic or a plant-based sector, how do we deal with consumerism and recycling? What does it mean in, in terms of addressing anything that previously Western countries would foister on the countries that are lesser developed because they see that as a way of building their economy. There's so many questions and there are so many people working hard to address all of that. I think in terms of like uh, EVs, for instance, uh, it is a real tipping point at the moment where we need some regulation to persuade people that this is the way forward. And in fact, for EVs and electric vehicles, it isn't just about climate change, it's about air quality and health. So that's where you've seen, you know, cities go forward and say, we want no, no uh, fossil-based vehicles here in London, but also Paris, Madrid. And in fact, recently we've had World No Car Day, so even avoiding having cars. So it's about how do we make those choices and get the champions and the advocates in the general public also seeing that this is a good choice for a good life. Now, in other countries who are yet, I think there's nearly close to half a billion people who still don't even enjoy having electricity as a source of energy for their homes or their lives. How do we, as the broader society in the world, and I hope to see this in COP as well, talk about how do they microwave, they leapfrog, they transition what they choose to use to have a modern life comes from renewable and clean sources and doesn't damage the planet. And we have the wherewithal to be able to do that. I mean, COP28, there was a lot of talk about the global south, about communities yeah. that thus far have been left behind. There was also quite a lot of talk about technology and production, particularly in the oil and gas sector, of course, and yeah. the, the pledges that came with the kind of location that was unavoidable very, location of... Very clever, actually, yeah. to be in those locations because it shone a light 
on how those nations, particularly in, in Dubai, have benefited from fossil fuels. But, the, you know, the optimistic side of my nature hopes that this is really the pledges that they're going to make, that they are going to now invest an awful lot more. And we're seeing that investment happening. But we're also, unfortunately, still seeing a large usage of oil and gas as well, as the vagaries of aspects like war and the market have put pressures on how we can have a, a good and easy transition. We can't. This is the real richness of the choices that we have to make. So that said, what do you think the emphasis will be in Baku? I'm hearing that it's going to be more about finance, about the market, about those sort of discussions, and perhaps those sort of individuals from the investment sector and large finance may be there in, in larger numbers this time round. Do you think there'll be a shift, an examination of those priorities? Well, again, uh, COP29 in Baku is being held in a, a nation known for its petrochemical sector. So it will be coming under focus again. And there are three big elements that I would like to see happen there. I would like to see a tightening, an understanding of methane leakage and nations and corporates involved in oil and gas sector really clamping down on that. The second would be, we know we're going to be needing oil and gas going into the future. We're living through this energy transition. We're not switching things off today, not even in 2030, for all the other elements of the work that we need to deliver in a modern life across the world. But we need carbon capture and storage and bringing that to bear and people financing that and, and actually getting it built. And then the last big area is understanding about hydrogen. Hydrogen has been discussed so much because it is an important role to play. It is a, an energy store, it's also an energy use, and it's also a, a formation of a chemical in many of the things that we depend on when we look at agriculture and fertilizers. So how do we make sure that the hydrogen that we use is actually a net zero hydrogen, a low carbon hydrogen? I personally would like us to see an accounting approach developed that puts a greenhouse gas label on every molecule of hydrogen. So the hydrogen's role is absolutely clear. So when it comes to these annual gatherings, Scotland was all about getting the commitment, Sharm el-Sheikh about implementing those commitments. Other issues like oil and gas and Global South dominated the meeting in the Gulf. What would you like to see prioritised in the meeting in Baku? I would like to see that the, the nations have committed to their national, nationally determined uh, you know, commitments because in January, in fact, they have to come out and, and put out that global spreadsheet of what all the different nations are doing ahead of COP30. So 29 is pivotal to absolutely get the rest of the world to believe that our leaders, the investor and finance community, are not greenwashing, that they're telling the truth and that we're having consistent policy and a really aligned regulatory political uh, agreement. Now, everybody, every nation's going to do it its own way, but to have that framework reinforced and with clear demonstrations of core actions that they're doing and, and showing what they have done is going to be absolutely vital. If they can do that before having to wait for January would be brilliant because then that gives everybody hope to show that we're going to be back on track. Dr. Nina Skorupska, thanks so much for joining us. Great to hear the insights from someone with such uh, perception and clarity, isn't it? Let's hope the leaders at COP are listening as well. I'm Andrew Wilson, and this is Future Energy Talks, streaming now. Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda.